Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Contrarians. Tonight, we are doing a Dark Horse panel on Led Zeppelin 3. Now, if you've ever watched these panels and you think, man, these guys are really interesting, but they don't have nearly enough time to make their points, you need to check out Wild Mood Swings, Disintegrating the Cure, where we go at length album by album through the Cure's discography. It's a pan, um, made mostly of contrarians. There's one non-contrarian panelist, but it is a fantastic book. Mr. Andy Blacksugar is in it. I'm in it. Peter Kerr, lots of others. It's well worth your time. Now, um, the Dark Horse series, we take an album, which is not one of the most popular albums by an artist, and we discuss it to death because that is what we do. I'm going to start off with just a little bit of research I've done on Led Zeppelin 3. Hopefully I don't need to explain who Led Zeppelin is to anyone. If so, welcome to the internet. Uh, this album was recorded late 1969, early 1970, released October 5th, 1970. It was certified gold in the U.S. in three days and uh, is currently certified six times platinum for six million sales. Um, Let's see here. When it came out, the reviews were not exactly glowing. I was going to read some uh, excerpts from Lester Bang's review in Rolling Stones, but that review is a hoot. I recommend anybody just Google the Rolling Stones review of Led Zeppelin 3. It's really funny. There's some good stuff in there. So I'm not going to bother quoting that. Uh, Jimmy Page was so traumatized for, by reviews for this album that he wouldn't give a media interview for 18 months. So that gives you an indication of how the, uh, how the press felt about this album when it came out. Currently, though, obviously there's been a reappraisal. If you look at All Music, which is a review aggregator site, more than 8,000 reviews have it sitting at five stars. So I think it's fair to say that as time goes on, people really like this album. So we are going to start off uh, with Martin Popoff. Now, Martin may not have written the book on Led Zeppelin, but he certainly wrote a book on Led Zeppelin, album by album. Another Thanks great guys. read. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Martin, why don't you start us off and uh, first explain to the audience why Led Zeppelin 3 is a dark horse sitting at 13 million sales. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Uh, is it a dark horse? I mean, it, it spent a lot of time as uh, as... Yeah, yeah, somewhat of a dark horse in that it seems to be one of the lesser explored ones. I mean, it's it's not it doesn't have as bad a reputation as presence or in through the outdoor, but those seem to be newer. Well, they are newer. I, and it seems to be everybody talks about them more. And I and I guess just by them being temporarily newer and Zeppelin was, you know, twice as big a band uh, by that point or three times as big. You know, they they seem to be the ones that are. um debated over and fretted over and and liked the least i mean i also see sometimes i see houses of the holy not speaking uh, spoken about too highly either um but this one also comes in for that but you know rather than being spoken about poorly it just seems to be somewhat ignored uh you know as much as a zeppelin album can be ignored um i mean i love it to death i it is a dark horse for the obvious narrative that um it surprised a lot of people with how much acoustic stuff is on it. Of course, um, boy, I don't want to say everything and then, and then, you know, use up everybody's material. So I'll, I'll try to be sparing with this. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so, so there's the idea that, um, you know, a lot of it was inspired and, 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 and written at, at Bronyar cottage where, where plant had uh, um, vacationed with his family. So he took Jimmy there and there was no running water and all this sort of stuff, no electricity. So it made them write, more acoustically there's a lot more uh instrumentation uh john paul jones really sort of stretches out on this they do everything themselves but there's 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 pedal steel by by page and there's a string arrangement and stuff um you know out on the tiles is is said to be more or less written musically by john bonham which is kind of interesting um and then they recorded headley grange so they're still kind of out in the country anyways doing that you know there's some olympic and there's terry manning's involved at art and stuff like that um but yeah so so the idea is that um it, it doesn't have a lot of heavy stuff on it in fact it almost feels with the sort of um the sort of uh thinner and maybe 
slightly more trebly uh, feel of the production uh, that even the heavy songs don't sound as heavy as the so- heavy songs on one and two. So you get immigrant song and it's it's kind of a pounding sort of heavy song, but it it's uh, it's not recorded particularly heavy. And I think Celebration Day feels that way as well. It's got kind of fairly clean guitar out on the tiles on the other hand sounds fairly heavy um but uh yeah so just to just to go through quickly kind of what i think of it well yeah so we've got the album cover as well with the volvel thing uh done by zacron a guy that page knew so so obviously and that delayed the release of the album it's got the you know the turning thing with the little oh, here's my copy of it of course there we can uh, we can do this so there's the uh oh, can i get it to turn i can get it to turn a little bit there so you get the little wheel inside with the, uh, and uh, yeah, now a little bit of trivia. My very first rock t-shirt was this. So we were on vacation, 1976, right on, right on the beach in, uh, in LA. Uh, there we had guys, uh, there was a guy selling uh, the, the ones that are just like a, a colored shirt with, with that, that rubber that would peel off. So just the black. So I bought a orange one of that. And I bought a, a red one of, um, of uh, volume four, the volume four album cover done the same way when I was 13 years old on the beach. So, uh, so yeah, so just quickly, um, I, I will say, um, immigrant songs. Okay. I'm not a huge, massive, crazy fan of it. Um, it's, it's there. I've always liked it. Uh, maybe more as a kid, but I, I think friends, uh, friends is one of my favorite Zeppelin songs of all time. It's got an alternate tuning that he uses there. The string arrangement sounds very moody and Kenneth Angerish, you know, Jimmy page with Lucifer rising kind of feel to it. Um, and celebration day, I've often called my favorite Zeppelin song of all time. I think that's a really cool, complicated sort of riff. I've always compared it to, uh, Aerosmith draw the, line with the way it's got this weird riff that sort of carries on i i really like that about it since i've been loving you is is the big blues that kind of replaces the old big blues and it becomes a staple in their catalog out the tiles i like and side two you know it's uh not everything has full full drums on it there's there's hand claps there's uh you know gallows pole traditional uh tangerine i think is good uh that that's the way i think is good um what else we got the hats off to harper is traditional so it's got two traditionals on there what am i forgetting what else what is there one more on your stomp run your stomp so yeah so that's your your um you know uh inspired by being bring it brawn yard and then there's a brawn yard on uh on uh, physical graffiti as well. So uh, I, I always rate this album. Um, I always physical graffiti is absolutely my number one. My number two is I usually go with this one or four, this one or Led Zeppelin four are, are really high for me. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, without further ado, I'll rate it a, uh, I'll rate it a uh, nine out of 10. Let's go with the nine out of 10. Wow. There you go. I praise indeed. Mm-hmm. Okay, not sounding very dark horse so far, but we're going to roll with it. All right, let's go down to Joe B., the original Contrarian <laughs> Patreon subscriber. Numero uno. Joe, welcome back. Wow. Thank you. It's great. Good to be back. Uh, so Led Zeppelin has, I mean, over the years, it's they're one of my top five bands of all time. <clears throat> but it was interesting because I had the single for Whole Lot of Love. I had the single for Immigrant Song. But I really didn't jump in. My friends and I didn't jump into the whole hard rock thing and the rock album thing until like 1976, 77. So I actually, the, the first new Zeppelin album I purchased was Presence. So I love that album. I, I, that's contrarian. But we went, you know, we had to do the back catalog then. So my first new albums were Presence and Song Remains the Same. And you hear Celebration Day and Song Remains the Same. And it's a great tune on that. This is a dark horse album because we slagged it when it came, you know, we bought it because the whole second side's acoustic and there's a lot of acoustic tunes. But now that I've listened to it more and I've actually gone on a Led Zeppelin binge the last six months where I listened to that complete collection and I listened all the way through. And I, I love a lot about this album. And what I love about the album is, there's a few of the uh, acoustic songs. First of all, the heavy songs are great. What's odd about the heavy, the whole album is weird. Let me put it that way. And I like that weirdness that two of the three heavy songs in there have no guitar solos. So there's not a guitar solo on out of the tiles or immigrant song, but they they're kick-ass songs. 
And of course, Celebration Days, Martin said, is one of their best songs. It's, it's amazing. But I really think that Since I've Been Loving You is probably his best blues effort. Um, Friends, I think, fits great between Immigrant Song and Celebration Day. Uh, you know, Gail's, Gail's Pole. Um, so Gail's Pole, that's the way Brian Your Stomp hats off to our Harper. Not a big fan of those songs. I can skip them. But Tangerine, I think, is amazing. But, you know, I've noticed it when in reading Martin's book, too, like, there's some really weird things on this album. Like you hear, and since I, I've been loving you, you hear like a squeaking sound from the drum or something. And like the beginning of Tangerine, they cut out, or even the beginning of Immigrant Song, there's some weird stuff on there. Um, on Out of the Tiles, it sounds like Robert Plant says stop at one point. It's just some really bizarre stuff, but it's cool. I think what makes this a dark horse album now for me as a full on Zeppelin fan, it's wedged between so many great albums. Like I put Led Zeppelin two is a nine out of 10, four is a 10 out of 10, physical graffiti is a 10 out of 10. Um, you know, House of the Holy, probably eight or nine out of 10. So you got this album that's, yeah, it is kind of forgotten, but the, Heavy songs on it are just great. But again, it's I, I like it because it's so odd, it's so out there, and it's in for the most part, it's listenable. I would give it a seven out of ten. But it's definitely, I think it's a dark horse because it's wedged in between so many great, amazing albums. And this is just a very good album. Nice. Cool. Very good, Joe. Well, certainly when you're talking about arguably the most legendary band from the 1970s, you're talking about, uh, you know, matters of degree, right? Let's go to uh, Andy Black Sugar, back from exploding heads with the ultra heavy beat and joining us on The Contrarians. Andy, tell us about Led Zeppelin Three. All right. Thank you. Uh, Led Zeppelin Three. I really love the album. But um, again, we're talking about degrees of brilliance here with Led Zeppelin. Let's just talk about the first six albums, I think, are uniformly um, great. I would put Zeppelin three at the bottom of those six, though. Um, and the reason is I have two reasons. One is I don't think they picked the best material for it. And two is the sequencing is off. Um, they were masters at sequencing their albums. I mean, you listen to the first album and, you know, it's as, it's as various as Led Zeppelin three, really. It has acoustic stuff. It has light and shade. It has different genres. It has long songs and short songs, but the way it is all assembled, it's just like, uh, you're, you're just on the edge of your seat the whole time. Um, so, you know, Led Zeppelin three it sort of starts out seeming like it's going to be one of those, you know, on the edge of your seat kind of albums. The first half of it is, is just a thrill ride. Um, you get this barnstorming opening song. It's, you know, two and a half minutes or so. Uh, and then you've got the, the creepy, see if you guys can hear this, the, the, the creepy C tune. <laughs> Pair that with the string arrangement and, and the, the, the wordless vocal in unison. It's diabolical sounding. It just gave me shivers the first time I heard it when I was a kid. And, um, you know, the lyrics are actually quite benign in that song, but the music is just so sinister. Um, and, you know, you've got Celebration Day, which is kind of like an upbeat, good kind of rock and roll Led Zeppelin song. Um, the blues number on here is is sort of the the Jimmy Page moment on the album where he really gets to cut loose and he was still really a contender as a guitar hero at, at this point in his career and um, you know uh, well I'll play one more one more example because when we talk about hard rock bands doing blues it can it, it can sort of seem like a cliche like um, like everybody does a blues so what. But Led Zeppelin would do these things like these turnarounds. And that 
is what makes Led Zeppelin genius, that they did that. Nobody else did that. Um, it lifts the whole thing up out of a standard bar room, 12 bar blues. Um, they add that exotica, that magic, that weird dark kind of um, genius to it. And, uh, and it's a minor blues as well. So it, it, it's a one, four, five, but they're all minor chords. So it's super, super dark. Um, out on the tiles, it's just a great catchy riff thing with like complicated time. And it's got, it just ticks off all the boxes and it's a real tight little thing. And then you get into the second side and all that dynamic kind of peaks and valley stuff is gone. By the time you get to the third track, you're like, wait, another acoustic song? Um, so it, it just feels odd. It's an odd kind of um, unsatisfying feeling to just listen to this thing from front to back. Now, if you want to talk about the songs and the quality of the material on that second side, it's pretty great. I mean, the first three songs, I think, are... Um, are well worth their inclusion on this album. I think the last two songs are kind of borderline throwaways, uh, particularly um, Hats Off to Roy Harper, which sounds very, very, I mean, I love the looseness and the spontaneity, but it's pretty undercooked. It's pretty kind of, I don't know, it, it's, it doesn't have the, that, that aura of the, the Jimmy Page kind of uh, meticulousness. It just sounds kind of tossed off. And, you know, when you find out that they had written these other great songs in these sessions that they didn't use. So Down by the Seaside is one of them. Apparently, they wrote a version of the Rover during these sessions. Um, I think Hey, Hey, What Can I Do was floating around and Traveling Riverside Blues. So they had these great songs. Poor Tom as well, Andy. Which one? Poor Tom? Poor, poor Tom, apparently, which was on Coda, which I love. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently so that was there. So I'm just wondering, they had all this like A-list material or, or at least, you know, A-minus list material. And they, they like decided to put these kind of weird the song, songs that don't play to their strengths as a band. Let's, let's put it out. The last two songs just do, don't, don't play to the strengths of the quartet. I love the whole mythology of Jimmy and Robert in a cottage together jamming. And you, you get that feeling when you listen to the second side of this um but you know let, let's let's uh you know let, let, let's get everyone else involved as well um so you know so those are my complaints i think they didn't pick the best material i don't think it's sequ i don't know if you could sequence your way out of this material and still have a great album um i think it feels lopsided but i'm still really grateful that it's there and i can see where if you were a fan at the time following the band in real time you would have been disappointed because you have the first two albums that are meticulously put together and then this album is kind of like not well put together i don't think but you know with our 2020 hindsight we know that led zeppelin four was coming down the pike houses of the holy physical graffiti i mean three albums that to me are 10 out of 10 albums so um, okay, so yeah, one more comment. There's very little lead, lead guitar. That's right, Joe. Um, Celebration Day has a very tight kind of composed solo in it, as does what? Tangerine. And then, of course, he does a lot of soloing in Since I've Been Loving You. A couple other little things, you know, outro solo and gallows pole, but it's pretty restrained in terms of um, Jimmy's lead guitar. But I, I love that you get, you know, he's, he's bringing in that exotic element in Friends. That's my favorite song in this album. It's really, it, it, as you say, Martin, it has the, the Kenneth Anger kind of tie in that, that, that weird, sinister, witchy kind of exotic thing that he was doing. Um, and uh, so I'm glad, I'm glad that this, this document is there and, and it's fun to, to kind of poke at now and like take apart knowing that they still had, their greatest achievements probably ahead of them still. Um, so I'm going to give this one a seven out of 10. Nice. Very cool. Joe, you were going to ask about Roy Harper. Yeah. I, I want to ask Andy as a guitarist too, does Roy Harper have a similar core possession progression as celebration day? Almost. I, I hear like an acoustic that, I don't know. I, 
Yeah, there's some, there's some similarity in there. It's kind of like a bottleneck blues type of thing. It's kind of a Robert Johnson esque. Uh, it, it's just um, I, I I like it as it, you know this this would be a a great bonus to add to one of the reissues twenty years later or something. Not not it's not an album cut to me. Uh, you know, and Robert is singing through the the Vibrolux amp or whatever he was singing through with the, the vibrato on his voice. Um, yeah, it's a little, I, I see what you mean. It's a little bit similar, but it's, it's like an open tuning kind of bottleneck slide kind of thing. Nice. Cool. All right. Very good. Thank you, Andy. Tate, I don't have a personalized intro for you, sir. So why don't you just jump on and tell us what you think about Zeppelin three. And welcome. I would be glad to, um, so Led Zeppelin three was an album that I, I've been a Led Zeppelin fan for probably since middle school. So going on a decade at this point. And they're one of the bands that I don't really listen to their discography quite as much anymore because I listened to it so much back, you know, when I was first getting into them. So I know all, I, I pretty much know all the albums like front to back and um, Zeppelin three was never one that I really thought of in as high regard as a lot of the other ones. And this is coming from a person who thought that Into the Outdoor and Coda were like the two greatest things that Zeppelin ever did at one point in time. Mm -hmm. And I, I quickly realized after going back and listening to the early stuff that I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe not, that's not quite the case. Um, however, that being said, I, in my opinion, Zeppelin don't have a bad album whatsoever. I would probably put Zeppelin three at the bottom of my Zeppelin ranking, but it's still terrific. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of how highly I, um, I, I hold this band's catalog and yeah, you know, I, I hold Coda and into the outdoor, you know, just a little bit and, and presence while well, presence is like, towards the, the top for me, but um, I do hold Coda and Into the Outdoor just a little just a little bit above and uh, um, the ranking when it comes to Zeppelin 3. I know, I'm contrary, and you can flame me in the comments below. I know. Um, so I, I have, I definitely like it a lot more than I did when I was first getting into this band. Um, I have a, um, a deeper appreciation for the acoustic side more than I did back then. Um, Whenever I listen to, because I I'm I'm a drummer, and John Bonham is my second favorite drummer of all time. So a lot of my judgment on the Zeppelin catalog has to do with sort of his contribution to the music because of my my drummer bias, and for for the reason that Bonham was not really playing drums on you know a third of the album was part of the reason why I didn't hold Zeppelin three as in his higher regard, but kind of without that, you know, looking at trying to be, you know, get listening to it again with a, you know, sort of a non-biased um, uh, light or in a non-biased light rather. Um, I have quickly come to realize that um, I can enjoy the um, drum set list acoustic material in a way that I wasn't able to earlier. So um, just to go through the track listing real quick, uh, Immigrant Song, terrific. Um, I think it's done even better on How the West Was Won. Uh, you know, a, a staple bar band classic that every local band and, you know, any decent sized city in the world um, is going to cover on like the, the, um, you know, the, the circuit there. Uh, I I'm, I'm in that I'm based in Nashville. And um, whenever I go down to Broadway, there's at least one band um, playing in the honky talks there. That's covering immigrant songs. So um, it's definitely have a lot of appeal. Great vocals by plants and that John, John Bonham's drum drumming um, beat is uh Iconic uh, Friends, I think, is a really good uh, um, folky um, acoustic tune with uh, um, a really cool string arrangement. Um, and uh, thank you, Andy, for giving us that uh, um, demonstration of the the cool acoustic guitar part uh, played by Paige. 
Uh, and uh, I, I don't think it's recorded particularly well, but I, that doesn't really bother me. The production on that particular tune, how it's recorded, kind of reminds me a little bit of the first Blue Cheer album. Um, sort of that really muddy production, but uh, th that doesn't really bother me all that much. Um, Celebration Day is amazing. Again, um, done even better. Um, the song remains the same. Uh, you know, great, great song. Um, and uh, if you if you listen to the version at Nebworth that they did, it was the second song in the set they did at Nebworth um, right after Song Remains the Same. Page, I don't know. Page sounds like that he's really just kind of half-assing that guitar rev. I mean, I'm not a guitar player, so I can't really speak with a high degree of authority on that. But if, from that clip, it sounds like that he's kind of half-assing that because he's playing it on his um, his double neck SG, if I recall correctly, at that particular show. And it's it, it, even when Paige sounds sloppy, it still sounds amazing. But um, it, uh, it just kind of has a, a more aggressive, like you know, not really caring all type of vibe to it. So anyway, I've, I've, I I enjoyed that particular live version of Celebration Day, but it's a great song regardless. Um, since I've been loving to use the, the blues, um, which I think is terrific. Um, I do, I will say, I do like You Shook Me and T for One better, but I understand the brilliance of Since I've Been Loving You and um, the the turnaround that they do and um, how it became a live staple for the band and John Bonham able to, you know, uh, playing those 32nd note um, fills and everything like that during it, during the guitar solo is absolutely terrific. Um, so Since I've Been Loving You is a great song as well. Um, out on the tiles, a great way to close out the um, the first side of the album. Um, I think the Black Crows did it really well uh, with uh, Jimmy Page at the Live at the Greek Theater um, when they kind of um, segged seamlessly into a whole lot of love. That's terrific. If you ever get a chance to listen to that, um, flip over the vinyl. Um, I think Gallows Pole is amazing. Um, I have been trying to learn John Bonham's drum part on that for years, and I still don't think I have it all that right or all that well. And uh, my mom, if she's watching this right now, uh, I think it's a great song. My mom hates the song. Every time she, um, every time we're listening to Led Zeppelin and Gallows Pole comes on, she's like, oh, turn that garbage off. I can't stand that. And I'm like, mom, come on. Um, but yeah, great um, arrangement of a, uh, of a traditional uh, folk song about a uh supposedly about a maiden who uh murders somebody and gets hanged for it and swinging from the gallows pole as uh robert plant says in the refrain there towards the end great song tangerine is a, is a terrific ballad um uh one of the few times i think john bonham is actually rushing and playing ahead of the time instead of playing behind the time as he's typically associated with um, but, uh, um, Tangerine is great regardless. Um, that's the way I think could have been trimmed down a little bit. I still think it's a pretty good acoustic folk song. Um, I like the battle of Evermore and going to California better. And, um, with that, but I, uh, that's the way it could have been trimmed down to maybe like three, three and a half minutes. I didn't think it needed to be five, but still a good song regardless. Um, Bronner R. Stomp is amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. Really good, really good romp, folky romp there. And then Hats Off to Roy Harper's okay. That's one of the few Led Zeppelin songs I really don't like all that much. Um, it's just kind of thrown together and to me, I think it would have been, I think poor Tom would have fit better as a closing song than hats off to Roy Harper. Um, but uh, overall, it's uh, probably an eight out of 10 for me because nice. of my dislike for hats off to Roy Harper and my um, opinion that uh, that's the way it could have been trimmed a little bit. Cool. Nice. <laughs> that is an, a fascinating summation because all but two songs that you went through, you preferred a version that wasn't on this album. Yeah. So I yeah, think yeah. you're kidding with that eight out of ten. 
but we'll go with it. All right, Peter Jones. What and, have you and got just, for just us, sir? quickly, you oh, couldn't yeah. really put poor Tom on with Gallows Pole and Bronyar Stomp there. You, you'd have three that were kind of, were kind of similar, right? So you, you, yeah, you, they yeah. didn't have to I pick. Can right? I can see that. Yeah, that's a good argument there. Mm. All righty. Um, all great summations so far. Um, I'm going to look at this a little bit differently. Uh, as Andy mentioned, I'm one of those guys who experienced this in real time as it came out. And at the time, I will concur that we were a little thrown. Um, having come from the first two records, um, of course, it starts out with Immigrant, as everybody said, but it quickly changes. So this is an album that is listener versus musician myself and then then versus now um i think this album has become in my opinion maybe perhaps one of their most important records for a lot of different reasons i think it is essential as a transitional record from the first two records to the ones that came after it there are elements that are in this that play key roles in those albums, like Andy mentioned, that come after that don't exist if they're not explored and written first on Zeppelin three. Um, I think it is one of the albums that I really gravitate to because it's one of the few in the catalog that's not overplayed to death. Other than Immigrant Song, which of course now has been sold out from everything from Thor to who knows what else, um, the rest of this album is not beaten to death in our public psyche like a lot of the other albums are. I think, yes, it's less heavy. There's less electric Jimmy, but there's no absence of Jimmy on guitar, he's just moved to acoustic and other instrumentation. And I think he's all over this record. The other strength of this, and Martin had kind of talked about the production on it, it is less heavy from a sense, but I feel it is more transparent. It is more easily seen. The individual parts are clearer and, and easier to hear. Great examples are listen to the crash symbols in Immigrant Song. The sustain and the decay natural through the mix is glorious. You know he's just in a room and they've got the mic set up minimally as they've always done with him. And it's very natural and it's really organic and really, really lovely. Quick segue is that they always talk about the John Bonham sound. Um, those of you know I'm a drummer as well. And when people try and get the bottom sound, they always make the mistake that it's about low and, and thundery. It's not. It's about a clarity and a power that comes from what he plays and how his drums are recorded. They look at what Eric Carr does on Creatures. They say, oh, that's bottom. That's bottom. It's really nothing like bottom. The cymbals are noise gated. They go cat and they cut off. They're all unnatural. It's got nothing to do really with how John sounded. John Paul Jones on here is exceptional on all of the tracks. And he, from an instrumental standpoint, may be the real hero on what's going on as he's got his fingers and his elements all over every track. And whether he's playing mandolin or he's doing keys or he's doing his bass lines, he's, he's got in the string arrangements that he does, he is kind of the super, super secret weapon on this. Um, I think... When I'm looking at the tracks, the Immigrant Song, yes, it's heavy. I love it because there's there are no drum fills in it, not a one. It's just all groove. It's just all feel, and it's, it's a simple riff. Jimmy really doesn't do anything different. All the moving parts are from John Paul. His bass lines are what makes that song move and transition from one part to the next, and I think that's what makes it great. Of course, Plant's vocals on it are outstanding. Um, Friends is out, is another great track. It is exceptionally moody. And, you know, Jimmy says he came up with this quote C tuning, but he's just kind of, I made it up. It wasn't really a, a traditional kind of tuning. He was just exploring. And I find that wildly creative and inspiring. They're just like, well, let me just see, 
see what'll work. Um, Celebration Day has a ton of energy and more great, great bass playing from John Paul and and Bonham is really strong and tight on it. Um, And I think it's a great, great track. Um, Since I've been loving you, Joe, the little squeak is the infamous Ludwig Speed King drum pedal that many of us drummers played for decades, but it, you always had your little kit with you of oil and everything because they squeaked like crazy. And you always had to lubricate them or else they go. And it's, it's right there on tape, which tells me how clean and transparent that recording was. It's an exceptional track and it's, it flows beautifully. Uh, Jimmy's exceptional on it. And it kind of does, take over the new mantle of the earlier blues tracks from the first two records and kind of takes it into a newer, a newer place. Um, of course it's, it's more authentically Zeppelin than maybe the borrowing of the (laughs) blues elements from the earlier tracks from all of the uncredited blues players who eventually got their credits later. But this is, this is Zeppelin and this is their take on the blues and it's unique to them and it really becomes one of their staples out on the tiles there's a great moment uh it was on an old vh1 show uh, from super group or something with ted nugent and sebastian bach or whatever but sebastian jason bach bonham, sing it. <laughs> yeah jason bonham tells the story because they got permission to use out on the tiles from jimmy page to use in that show Well, the way Jason says is that his dad, John, used to sing this melody and it had these lyrics about going down to the bar because he's out on the tiles and Jimmy heard it and they arranged it around it. And now you've got a song. Um, I think it's tremendously heavy. I love the way it works and I love, okay, I'm going to nerd out musicians. There's that one little bar of three, eight coming out of the transition section that turns it right back onto one and makes it sound really great and just kind of jars you for a second. And then like the, the ending riff when they're thundering out at the end is just as good as anything they've done. It, it reminds me of bringing it on home, the end of any of those riffs that are really essential and really strong. You get to side two and I think side two is really, really important Um, that songs and Tate mentioned them. I don't think you have going to California. You don't have battle of evermore. You don't have these songs coming later if they hadn't worked through some of these arrangements. And I think part of the beauty of this record is how they recorded it. The first record's always the first record. And you know, you do what you do. You've been playing songs before. Zeppelin II was a mismatch. Uh, You know, it was just all over the place, recorded here, when they had a break, when they had this. So it's not a fluid recording session, and they didn't set aside time to write. They did that here, and it has a different sense to it. It feels cohesive as a a sound and as a feel. And I think that makes a big difference. And I think that also impacts how they record moving forward, saying, okay, we're going to do this as a cohesive entity. We're going to get our tracks. We're going to do our album, not try and tour in between dates and everything else. So I think that's an important change from what they had done before as well. Gallo's poll is really cool because even though it's acoustically driven, once the bass comes in and once John comes in, the heaviness goes through the roof. There's still no electric guitar on it, but it's so driving and so thunderous. So it was Ozzy who once said that, yes, you can talk about Tony Iommi and rightly so he said, but all the heaviness came from geezer and bill. And I think Zeppelin and any other band purple, any of these groups like that, it's true. It comes from the foundation that you can even with acoustic have John Paul Jones and John Bonham, and it'll still sound heavy. Um, I think the vocals that plant delivers on side two are maybe some of the best of his career. They're very strong. Uh, His pitch is exceptional. 
Um, I love John Bonham's high backing vocals that he would do live. John was a really great singer um, and he contributed those things as well. And yeah, there's not as much drums on it, but that's okay. Um, when you get to, I think that's the way is maybe one of their better and, and strongest, more acoustic numbers of their whole catalog. It's the melody and the chorus is so good. Uh, it's got just a relaxing kind of beautiful sentimental kind of feel to it, which is a really great listen. Um, the, and then Brown Yard is, is nice. And, you know, hats off. Yeah, I agree. Andy could probably take it off. And with this album coming in at just over 43 minutes, which is long for a lot of records back in that day, they probably could have left that off at three minutes and still been at 40 minutes. And nobody would have thought that the album had cheated them from time-wise. Um, so you probably could have, could have left that off. Um, so at the time, I, I didn't rank it nearly as high, but hopefully over time and as I grew as a musician to appreciate the different aspects of it, um, I have this at a, at a nine and a half out of 10. This is my second favorite Zeppelin record now in my catalog. So I trail only Zeppelin two because there's just too many elements of that that are that are too ingrained and too strong. But I have uh, this one right there at, at a nine and a half out of ten. So nice, very cool. That's wicked, right, Peter. Those are some in-depth thoughts. As always, thank you very much. Yep. All right, uh, I have a few thoughts to throw in on the album. Always difficult to go last after these panels. Um, I am, as always with these panels, uh, in a slightly different place with Led Zeppelin than most of the other listeners. I did not grow up as a Led Zeppelin fan. Uh, in the 70s, and this seems weird in our circle of kind of hard rock uh, aficionados, but I didn't know anybody who listened to Led Zeppelin. All sorts of other bands, but I didn't know anybody who had Zeppelin. By the 80s, when I was more of an active consumer of music, I was in a very small town. There was no rock radio station. I didn't know anybody who had the Zeppelin albums. And most importantly, Zeppelin called it quits with John Bonham's death in 1980, and they were not a part of MTV, which was how I was exposed to music. So I never developed a love of Led Zeppelin until I moved to a bigger town, and then they were on classic rock radio, and they always just, Led Zeppelin were like stamping the 1970s on something. They were old person's music, right? That was, that was what happened in 1970s. Uh, and Zeppelin did own the 70s, the way the Beatles owned the 60s. They were one of the biggest bands in the world. Um, so when I met my wife, she's a huge Led Zeppelin fan, has all of their albums. In fact, all of them on album and CD. And I kept thinking, well, maybe it's time to listen to Led Zeppelin. And I would listen to them and just, eh, it didn't do it for me. So when this topic came up, I thought, ah, oh, Zeppelin 3, that was always one of my least favorite albums. I mean, I've tried the, the albums over and over again. They just don't stick, right? You know, you can't like everything. Music either speaks to you or it doesn't. Uh, and Zeppelin didn't speak to me. So we put on this album fully expecting to go, eh. And the weirdest thing happened. I, I really liked it. So I don't know where I'm at in my life that suddenly this album made sense to me. But all of a sudden, I enjoyed it. Even the things that I just cannot tell you how much I dislike, the Delta Blues. Uh, you know, there are Chicago blues, there's Texas blues, Delta blues is slow and acoustic-y and, and played with bottlenecks a lot. I find it the most boring music on the face of the planet. But even the Delta blues numbers on this album, I now enjoy. Uh, definitely Immigrant Song is my favorite track on the album as, you know, a lifelong metalhead. Uh, Immigrant Song functionally invents European-style power metal in 1970. All it's lacking is blast beats on the drums, and it's 18 years ahead of Halloween with Keeper of the Seven Keys, right? So uh, that gives it a very different flavor, but then you immediately go into more bluesy numbers. Uh, Friends is a good number, bluesy, very, very fast though still. Celebration Day, once again, bluesy, but with an electric rave up stuck over the top of it, so that keeps it more interesting for me. Um, 
I don't know what I think about Since I've Been Loving You. It's a little too long. I think it's designed for that kind of jammy. Led Zeppelin had this song in their catalog so they could stretch it out to 20, 25 minutes in concert um, and just, you know, go on it endlessly like they were the Grateful Dead. But Since I've Been Loving You has Hammond organ. Maybe not Hammond, but it has an organ sound. And I think that's fascinating because this album's 1970. The same time that Deep Purple and Uriah Heep are basically making the Hammond organ sound uh, an indispensable part of heavy rock. So this song really fits into the music of the time in a way that the other tracks do not. Um, Out on the Tiles, everyone says it's a great song. There's too much ooh yeah for me. Um, too much ooh yeah. I'm not a huge fan of nonverbal vocalizations. And he does so many of those. Ooh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Baby, baby. Uh, I know that was a core part of his style at this time, but that just that doesn't connect with me. Gallows Pole's good. Tangerine, I think, sounds like a dry run at Stairway to Heaven. It's got some very similar elements, like maybe they're doing a trial run, right? Um, now, for me... Dark Horse Song, That's the Way, is my favorite track on the album. It's the only track that Robert Plant sings down. He sings in his conversational tone instead of way up at the top of his range. There's no uh, nonverbal vocalizations. And it, maybe it's different for other people, but I kind of ignore the lyrics to Led Zeppelin songs. I don't think Zeppelin are known as being amazing lyricists. Maybe they are, in which case I apologize. But I ignore their lyrics. I think they're pretty throwaway. Uh, but this song's got great lyrics. Story about losing friendship and, you know, class conflict. And he really sings it with such heart that there's just nothing else on the album like it. And honestly, it elevates Side 2 for me. Without that track, Side 2 would just, it would not really have much going on. Uh, and I'm with Andy on the last two tracks. They are B-sides. Um, you know, John Bonham and uh, John Paul Jones are barely on Bronier Stomp at all. And they're not on, what's the last track? Hats off to Roy Harper. They're not on that at all, right? It's just Jimmy Page and Robert Plant. One on the left side and one on the right. There's no drums. There's no bass guitar. And it just makes me go... <laughs> How did the other guys in the band feel about being left off the, the last track on the album? I mean, you know, what a slap in the face. Uh, because I absolutely agree with Peter that John Paul Jones is the best musician in Led Zeppelin by a country mile. He's a multi-instrumentalist. He's an arranger of the string parts. He plays the organ and the keys and the mellotron. His bass part on... Um, the Immigrant Song is one of the most amazing bass parts ever recorded. And the, the speed at which he plays it is just blazing for 1970. He was so much faster than Jimmy Page was and so much more controlled. And without John Paul Jones, Led Zeppelin would simply not be the band that they are. So this will never be a primary source of enjoyment for me. I'm not going to I mean, I sat down with this album specifically just listening to my headphones and, and making notes for this chat. But in the future, I'm just going to put it on as background noise. I love a couple of songs. The rest of it, I don't mind. But that is actually a big step up from me before where I just threw this album out and said, you know, it's not very good. Now, I'm going to give it a six. Nice. Cool. So uh, that averages out all of us just doing quick math in our head, just underneath an eight. So not bad. Actually, slightly out of step with the Internet now, as it turns out, since the Internet are convinced that it's a five out of ten. But I'm going to put that down to the Led Zeppelin effect. And I'm sure that there are going to be plenty of people in the comments uh, saying, how dare we give this album anything less than a five out of five or ten out of ten rating. But we can just see how that goes. I want to preempt so, another. I want to preempt another set of comments by saying that um, Bron Stomp does have John Paul Jones and and John Bonham in it. Um, they have subtler roles, but uh, apparently Bonham was playing hand percussion, castanets, and you know, I even read spoons. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, John Paul Jones is playing double bass on that. 
it's just subtler. It's, it doesn't have the kind of trademark kind of Led Zeppelin rhythm section vibe to it, but they're in there. Um, and as far as I know, hats off to Roy Harper's just Jimmy and, and Robert. Yeah. And I'll add a couple I, quick things too. Uh, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I agree. You know, we've heard it a couple times. John Paul Jones on immigrants on our, our band in the eighties played that and, and our bass player, Sammy, it, it always, you know, scared him uh, when it was time to have to do that quick run uh, thing in there as well. And, and the other thing I, I find that's interesting is, is you could take hats off to Roy Harper, Bronyar and gallows pole and say, uh, those are the songs that kind of invented the uh, first of all, Van Halen doing the joke tunes and then and then that thing carrying on to other hair metal bands who were emulating Van Halen and Led Zeppelin when they would do their little acoustic. Oh, aren't we authentic tunes? Right. right. Um, so that would happen a lot. And the last thing I wanted to say is that um, I love that comment, Peter, I think you had mentioned the sustain of the symbols and immigrant song. I hear that, and and where I hear it the most on this is the "Since I've Been Loving You" symbol. Yep. Yeah. Anywhere, yeah, <laughs> they just go forever, right? It's glorious, it's gorgeous sounding symbols. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's all I wanted to add. Let me ask Andy if I can. Andy had talked about sequencing on this. I've looked at these tracks over and over mm. and tried in my head. I'm not sure how I would rearrange them any differently. <laughs> No, that's why I said, I don't know if you can sequence this into a great save it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't know if, I, I don't know if there's a better way to do it. Um, I think side A is, is amazingly sequenced. Um, and side B sounds like a, an EP, like self-contained, like exactly like yeah. its own thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's always felt like it's always felt like uh, very disjointed because of that. And and in the back of my mind, I, you you put it perfectly. I've always had that word EP, you know, going around in my head sort of thing. There's something about this feels like an EP. Yeah. Right. So, Out on the tiles could easily be an album closer. Sure. If yeah. you are yeah, a Led Zeppelin you know, fan, you have to pick up this book. It's Martin, you go into such detail. And thanks, I think yeah. in yeah. With this topic, you do address all the strangeness on this album. Like you do talk about, when they're out of the tiles, you hear Robert Plant go, stop. And it's like, what do you just, why do you just say that? And you hear the squeak on the drum and you address all that stuff. The beginning of Tangerine is strange. I, I think that adds to the uh, ambiance of this album. And it's really yeah. grown on me since. Like there's, I said, there's a few, first, there's like, I want to point out a couple of other weird things that just weird recording artifacts and stuff. So everyone talks about a squeaky kick drum. There's the, the, the synthesizer swell, the beginning of um, celebration day, which apparently was put in to cover up and accidentally recorded over intro. So I guess the engineer accidentally uh, erased the proper intro to that song, which we'll never hear. And so they, they put in this, this, yeah, you know, as far as I know, the only ex example of a synthesizer on this whole album, right. um, or the only instance of a synthesizer. But you also have like the guitar. If listen to the guitar in the beginning of Celebration Day, and you hear the stereo split, where it's the same performance, but on the left side it sounds like it's direct into the console, and on the right side, on a separate track, it's an amped version with some grid on it, and it's a really cool thing to listen to. Um, you know, they didn't have, I don't know how many tracks they were using, probably eight tracks in these days. Yeah, but, probably. Um, a lot of sharing. So there's a lot of sharing and there's a lot of things Leads. being dubbed over. Yeah. And there's at the end of Gallows Pole, as it starts to fade, you hear all of a sudden Robert Plant in mid wail, just ah! like it just, it just, it, it sounds like the beginning of it was dubbed over with whatever they put. You know mm. what it could have been a guitar it could have been something else but all of a sudden you just hear this like robert in in mid-scream um and you know that, that that's the kind of stuff that we love that's why we love having these albums because it's it's warts and all of the seams are showing and you know you get precious little of that kind of thing coming out nowadays because everything is so meticulously um corrected um so yeah, it's uh, it's a fun listen. Nice, Very and cool. this is also a great you know the BBC sessions. Yeah, I don't know if you can see this, but yeah, great live versions. Um, 
arguably better than the studio versions in some cases. And you really hear just, you know, the whole band is really uh, still firing. I, I mean, like Robert's voice is still really powerful and full and he's got his full range. And Jimmy's, like I said, still out for blood on the guitar. Um, both of those guys kind of start losing their chops, you know, as the seventies go on. I almost feel like, you know, um, when they talk about making a deal with the devil, there's a lot of folklore about Led Zeppelin, you know? Um, I almost feel like Jimmy's deal was he traded in his, his guitar virtuosity for this amazing compositional and arrangement ability that just went up and up and up as he kind of became a sloppier guitar player. Um, but on Led Zeppelin three and this sort of like 1970, 71, they're still all really amazing performers live. So yeah, the BBC sessions are a really good companion to all this stuff. Nice. Well, and I think too, uh, I'd mentioned it just briefly to t tag on what Andy said that live, um, you know, John Bonham was a totally different player live than he was in the studio. I mean, there's really no comparison um, in the studio, very disciplined. He played for the song, didn't overplay remotely live. He was kind of an un, un you know, <laughs> he was a released animal. He was crazy <laughs> with the amount of fills and extra power and all the other stuff that he did that between him and John laid such a foundation that, I mean, Jimmy could have pretty much done anything over it and it would have really worked because they were so tight and careful to keep everything cohesive, no matter where Jimmy went or how he was playing or how sloppy he may have appeared. So it, it all just worked. I'll just right. mention, I'm, I'm no expert on where these things are on Led Zeppelin live albums, but my favorite magic led zeppelin moment uh is when they when john bonham does that crazy switchback jamming thing on immigrant song on some live maybe it's all many of the live. oh the but, yeah, first that, part of hot in the west was one yeah i think that's oh, yeah he unbelievable yeah that's the coolest led yeah. zeppelin live difference i think out of you know all the yeah. led zeppelin bootlegs probably so I, love when jimmy, I love when jimmy page like he throws in out in the tiles before black dog or, yeah. or bring it on home before black dog or um he he plays the rover and then goes in the sick again i love it he does that stuff too i i i kind of appreciate the sloppiness at times because it's it truly is why as andy said like everything's so sanitized now and there's backing tracks and everything has to be perfect and i just love that that sloppy live feel i it's it's, what, it's, it's real yeah what i'm hearing here is that all of you agree with tate that non-album versions of these songs are actually better than what you get on the album. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Just different Probably, from me. Yeah. <laughs> Just different. Maybe yeah. Celebration Day. <laughs> All right. Tate, I'm going to give you the last word, man. What have you got? Um, I, just to kind of just to kind of go off of what everybody was saying um, about Led Zeppelin Live moments, um, I really like it when uh, whenever any live version of Black Dog you hear and you know, the latter part of the band's career. Um, at the very end, you just hear Bonham just put on like a clinic doing his triplets and everything like that. Like the, the fastest Bonham triplets you will ever hear is at the end of any live version of Black Dog from 77 on. Mm -hmm. um, I also really like the particular fill that he did well any any sort of plan any like live version of no quarter post 75 is unbelievable and my favorite led zeppelin like live thing is has always been the song remains the same the song at Nebworth, although I think he did the, I, I think Bonham did this starting in 77 too. But when they go into the slow section on the Houses of the Holy Studio version, it's da 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 which is terrific. But on the live version, he just goes off and just starts playing these random triplets. Like any any non-musician would listen to this and think, like, well, what the hell is he doing? And he just nails going back into the, you know, the day da, and the plant starts singing his part. It just, it just knocks me out every time I hear that. And I've tried to replicate it and I can't do it. And I 
am determined to to be able to get that. So anyway, very cool. All that right, awesome. there you go. Six different interpretations of Led Zeppelin three. Is it a dark horse? You decide. Are our opinions uh, contrarian on this album? I don't know. You can decide that too. I hope you join us for another video. We'll be back soon. Check out the Patreon if you want to get involved in these videos, and we appreciate you watching.